Hey, Tony from Songwriters Chop Shop here, and this is Songwriting Tips from Famous Songwriters. If you want to improve your songwriting skills, stick around to the end of this video because I'll be chop shopping tips from famous songwriters and turning them into actionable steps that you can apply to your songwriting today. This week on Songwriting Tips from Famous Songwriters, a guy who's had 21 songs placed in Billboard's number one spot. He's made some of the most anthemic hit songs in the past 20 years, including Hit Me Baby One More Time, I Kissed a Girl, and Shake It Off. If you don't know his name, you definitely know his music. It's Max Martin. Tip one, hooks. It's incredibly important to me that you remember a song right after the first or second time you hear it. That something sticks to you, something makes you feel, I need to hear that song again. So how can we make our songs do this? Well, all Max's songs are full of hooks. That's one place we can start. So what is a hook? Well hooks can be a lot of things, but here I think he's talking about melodic motifs. A melodic motif is a bunch of notes or a musical phrase that happens throughout the song. It could be just a couple of notes long or a couple of measures, but it's something you instantly recognize and identify with that song. There can be more than one and they usually appear throughout the song. Here's a couple of examples. Look at this motif in the Beatles song, Here Comes the Sun. The motif appears in the chorus and the verse. And this is pretty catchy. Wrecking Balls by Miley Cyrus. Or this song by Jaws. Just two notes long but pretty unforgettable. Think of them as the musical equivalent of clickbait headlines you just can't ignore. And this applies to music in all styles. Just because we're talking about Max Martin, someone who produces pop music, doesn't mean these techniques aren't used in all genres of music. Check out this Nirvana classic, Smells Like Teen Spirit. And remember, melody has pitch and rhythm. See how the melodic rhythm repeats exactly but the variation is on the pitch? And look at how in the pre-chorus the whole section revolves around two notes, just like the Jaws theme. Check out some of your favourite songs and see how much they recycle melodic motifs and how many there are in each song. Look at some sheet music, then load some MIDI files. Check out hooktheory.com where you can actually see this in action. And try it for yourself, make up a riff with maybe three notes and repeat it until you feel it should change. Tip 2. Management. <laughs> Know how to manage your hooks. The melodies themselves, they may appear wherever. It's never like, now I'm gonna sit down and write this or that kind of song. The melodies may show up in the car and in the shower. From then on, it's all about how you manage the melody, how you make sure that you'll be able to hear it over and over again without tiring of it. So how do we manage our melodic motifs? The one to three approach seems to be a reliable starting place. It's basically this. You introduce an idea or a motif, establish the motif by repetition, then introduce some change or variation. This is a really common practice as you'll see in the examples coming up. Tip three, repetition. <laughs> Understand the power of managing repetition to keep it fresh. If the chords change a lot over the course of a song, it's better to stay within the same melodic structure. You can also sing the chorus melody as a verse. For instance, Let's Go Crazy by Prince, one of Max's heroes. The verse and chorus of that song are exactly the same, but as a listener you don't really notice since the energy of the chorus is completely different compared to the verse. Once the chorus comes in, you feel like you've heard it before. It automatically creates a sense of familiarity. It's like, say a friend of yours was talking about someone they know, then you meet that someone and you feel like you kinda know them already. You might not like them, but a sense of familiarity can go a long way. And if we take a look at the Prince song, we see the verse and the chorus are the same with slight variations. So 
So this whole song is based around a three note motif where the verse foreshadows what's coming up in the chorus. This foreshadowing technique can be seen in songs like E.T. by Katy Perry or in a less obvious way Shake It Off by Taylor Swift and even songs Max hasn't worked on like It Smells Like Teen Spirit but Max uses exact melodic repetition mostly although you will find minor changes i.e. he takes away or adds a syllable or a pickup note to a phrase or alternates the pitch of the notes while keeping the same melodic rhythm to a phrase. Slight changes that are hardly noticeable but keeps the repetition more natural. So with recycling melodies so much, how does he keep it from getting monotonous? Tip 4. Balance. If you've got a verse with a lot of rhythm, you want to pair it with something that doesn't. Longer notes, something that might not start at the same beat. The most crucial thing is always how it feels. Here Max gives the example of Shake It Off by Taylor Swift. The verse has a melodic motif, mostly made up of 8 notes, starting on the third beat of the bar. We can also see how this motif is managed by the 1 to 3 pattern. It's repeated twice with variation the third time round. After that segment you need a few longer notes in order to take it all in, otherwise it's simply too much information. So the pre-chorus is mostly made up of longer quarter notes starting before the beginning of the bar. This section is also repeated twice. Also we see some foreshadowing of the chorus. Sweet and salt might be a better description that's easier to grasp. You need balance at all times. If the verse is a bit messy, you need it to be a bit less messy right after. It needs to vary. You can see this balance through contrast technique in a lot of Max's songs. Listen to Hit Me Baby One More Time by Britney Spears, or Can't Stop This Feeling by Justin Timberlake, or E.T. by Katy Perry. Tip 5. Energy. I like it when a song is like a journey, building up along the way. That they start out smaller than they end. Along the trip, you add elements and make the listener less likely to tire. Then at the end, euphoria. Like a roller coaster has a slow build up that causes tension before the big drop. Where all that tension is released and everyone screams at the same time. Or sings in chorus. So let's take a look at the Taylor Swift song and the Nirvana example again in terms of hook, repetition and balance and how this all relates to energy levels of a song. Starting with Shake It Off. Within the verse, the melodic motif repeats twice, then a third time with some variation. This makes up the verse, which itself repeats twice, with a change coming in the form of the pre-chorus. Here, a different melodic motif repeats twice, the third time having some variation. It also foreshadows the chorus. Then to the chorus. Well guess what? We see the same pattern of repetition. By now you might have guessed this 1 to 3 pattern and its variations of repetition are no coincidence. Using it to manage your motifs and song sections, whatever rate of repetition you use allows you to 1. Set up an expectation in the audience. 2. Shatter that expectation with change or variation that interrupts the pattern and gets the audience's attention. This happens mostly on a subconscious level. So the contrast within and between the sections is only effective because of all that repetition establishing an expectation. Without the contrast there would be no balance as Max calls it, within or between the song sections. It might sound a bit complicated but just remember the 1 to 3 pattern or some of its variations is usually an effective way to present information and keep your audience engaged. It's all based on the principle of setting up an expectation through repetition then shattering that expectation. It can also be used to manage the energy of your song. Even so, that's a lot of repetition, so what the hell does this next quote mean? It's more about working with the dramaturgy of the melody. It should never get repetitive. So this is where building the energy level of the song comes in. The artist might be singing the same thing, but they're not singing it in the same way, emotionally or energetically. Also what is going on underneath with the music, again, might be playing the same thing, but not in the same way. Maybe slightly faster or louder, more instruments are coming in, maybe they'll get fuller or louder in the mix. A lot of things you might not notice unless you listen for them. That's really true for all songs. If you listen to the first, second and third chorus of a song, they don't sound the same. It's the same melody and all, but what really happens is that the energy changes. It's all about getting the listener to keep his or her concentration. And this doesn't just go for pop music. Let's jump back to Smells Like Teen Spirit, where we get a four bar melodic motif repeated twice, then changes for the third section with the pre-chorus. So there's the one to three pattern. The pre-chorus contrasts the previous section giving us our balance. It's based mostly on a two note motif that builds tension. And we can even see the foreshadowing trick in play. The fourth how low in each phrase and the first part of the chorus are almost identical, just an octave apart. <laughs> 
Then the chorus, which has a four note melodic motif. Although the pitch of these notes change, the melodic rhythm does not. And Smells Like Teen Spirit is also a good example for the energy levels in each section. It starts off huge with the intro, giving us a taste of things to come. Then it calms down in the verse, establishing repetition with the rhythm of the melodic motifs. Then comes the pre-chorus where the tension builds, which is another element of energy. Even through the repetition of the pre-chorus, we can feel the tension and energy build until we get to the chorus where all that tension pays off. So we have the same techniques at play here, hook, repetition, management, contrast and balance, and we even have the foreshadowing trick. And hopefully you're starting to see how flexible these techniques are. These are really communication tools. They can be used to write a formulaic pop song or an avant-garde jazz fusion and everything in between. But these techniques are used in probably every song you've ever heard. The best way to start using them in your own songwriting is to ask yourself, what do I want the listener to feel when they hear this song? What experience do you want to give them with your music? You've been moved enough by inspiration to write a song, so what you're singing about must be important to you. Therefore, is it not worth communicating it in a way that causes the same reaction in the people that hear it? Maybe, maybe not, but it's still worth asking the question. So, what do you want the listener to feel when they hear your song? Listen to some of your favourite songs and imagine, by the way they make you feel, what experience the writer wanted to give the listener. Then look at how they achieved this by the way of the concepts we talked about today. This will start to give you a set of options you can use in your own songwriting to design the ultimate roller coaster ride for your audience. Let me know in the comments if it made sense and if you could see yourself applying these techniques to your songwriting. Don't forget to like and subscribe and kick a bell or something. Okay, until next time.